who find it more convenient than coming to the eight other town hall meetings that, that we had uh, on the peninsula. And on tomorrow night will be the last one of the series on Salt Spring. So first of all, I, I welcome everyone. And I have a few housekeeping things to talk about before explaining how tonight will go. Just to get started, can I get by a show of hands because I see some new faces. How many of you have never been to an MP town hall meeting before? That's fantastic. Okay, welcome new people. Uh, let me explain what this meeting is. Uh, this is a completely non-partisan meeting. This is my way that I've discovered as extremely helpful to me and I hope helpful to constituents. Um, I, when I first was elected in 2011, I had promised in that campaign that I would find ways to receive direction and feedback from my employer. Collectively, you and everyone else living in San Angelo Islands are my employer and I work for you. So this series of town hall meetings in the fall, generally my timing is it's not quite fall, it sure doesn't feel like fall. Thank you for coming indoors on such a lovely night. But between Labor Day and when Parliament resumes, and right now I think Parliament resumes on Monday, September 18th, but between Labor Day and when Parliament resumes generally sometime in September, I hold town hall meetings on at least three or four locations on the peninsula and each of the five Gulf Islands to report to you on what's been going on in Parliament since we last held a town hall meeting, which was uh, in this room in January. And in January, on the same time schedule, between the end of the holiday season and when Parliament resumes in late January, I report on what happens in the fall session of Parliament. Tonight's meeting is going to be a little bit different. Uh, before I explain how it's different, I'd like to invite uh, my friend and colleague and my MLA, Adam Olson, to acknowledge territory and provide a, a welcome with at least a few words in St. Chauvin. I should.
So the way we're going to go forward, when they're, when? Anything? Yes, anything at all. You can ask anything at all. And you can't ask anything okay. at all. So in uh, the normal town hall format that I do, I try to hold myself to no more than 20 minutes of a very superficial, skimming the surface of everything that happened in the last session of Parliament, uh, which in this case is January till the end of June, and then a few events through the summer. I hold myself to 20 minutes and then open the floor to questions. But because Adam and I are both speaking to you tonight, I'm going to hold myself to no more than 15 minutes and then pass it to Adam uh, to also speak for 15 minutes. And then we'll open the floor for questions. There's a mic in the front where we can figure out logistics. Anyone who doesn't want to come forward to a mic, you'll find a way and let you ask a question from where you are. So just to say, uh, the, it was uh, right at practically at the very beginning of the session of Spring Session of Parliament on February 1st, a major blow, an issue that we've talked about a lot in Sandwich Gulf Islands, and for which I was honored to serve as a member of the Special Committee on Electoral Reform. Uh, a lot of you came down to Victoria when our committee held hearings there. We also held hearings uh, in, on Sartlet First Nation territory with representatives of five different First Nations communities in this area. But on February 1st was when the Prime Minister rewrote the letter of mandate that is basically the instruction letter to the minister responsible for democratic institutions. There had been a recent cabinet shuffle, but the new minister of democratic institutions, Karina Gould, had her letter of mandate rewritten on February 1st, and removing from the mandate for the minister of democratic institutions, the replacement of first past the post with a fairer system of voting as had been promised, not just in the liberal platform, but repeated in the speech from the throne. So I, I sure didn't see that coming, and it, it, uh, it remains a real concern for me, trying to get electoral reform back on the agenda. Meanwhile, we had a lot of legislation come through the House this spring. Uh, it, it, uh, some of the bills I was happy to support. I tried to amend most bills. Actually, we checked recently, and it turns out that since 1867, I'm the MP who puts forward more amendments on every bill than anyone has ever had. But, yes. It's because I'm there by myself as the Green Party. I, I try, to con try to comment on every bill, put forward amendments on every bill, and since I'm the only one, it, it does tend to be, and I, I'm, you know, putting forward a lot of amendments. Prolific. Prolific. Now, on Bill C-6, that was the citizenship bill, which is now law. For those of you who re recall that in the previous government, uh, the Conservative government, there were changes made to citizenship that made it a much more slippery concept. It's historically been the case in Canada ever since we've had a citizenship act that if you were a naturalized Canadian citizen, uh, you had all the same rights as if you were born here. Citizenship is citizenship is citizenship, and it wasn't a slippery concept. The only way that your citizenship could be removed uh, before, uh, I think it was Bill C-26 under Harper, was if you had committed fraud in your application for citizenship. Then you could have your citizenship stripped. But you couldn't commit some offense later on and find yourself stripped of citizenship and deported. So I'm very relieved that Bill C-6, which was brought in by the previous Minister of Immigration, John McCallum, who's now serving as Canada's ambassador to China, that legislation got all the way through the House and the Senate and has royal assent. And so citizenship is back to being a concept where naturalized citizens have the same rights as born in Canada citizens. We also had an omnibus budget bill this spring. And the omnibus budget bill was, unlike the previous government's omnibus bills, more to do with the budget and less to do with extraneous things. But I, I did uh, agree with the other opposition parties that the infrastructure bank as a concept should not have been folded into an omnibus budget bill where it couldn't be properly studied. And I still don't believe it was properly studied, but it was pushed through at, towards the end of the spring session by the majority of the votes with a time allocation used to shut down debates. Time allocation was used quite a lot in the spring session parliament to shut down debates. And that was largely because the NDP and the Conservatives in opposition were able to effectively shut down Parliament, so very little was happening. Now, why did they do this? Well, I'm going to yield the floor to aviation. I'm a member of the Aviation Caucus in Parliament, but that's because I like to defend my junior. Uh, what happened in uh, early March was that the government house leader, the 
these terms are from I'm more familiar with them, the term government house being leader based be an odd one for you. But it's it's the position in the House of Commons, each party appoints a government, I mean appoints a house leader. And the house leader is there to help organize the business of the house. So the government house leader is the one who says, we want to put forward this legislation. And the opposition party house leaders say, okay, well, if you put that forward on Tuesday, can we get a day to debate something we want to debate on Wednesday? And when things are going well, even if they're yelling at each other in the house, in private, they're getting along okay. And the business of the house proceeds with a schedule you can count on. Not to drag out the explanation of this, but things were not friendly in, this, in last spring. The NDP and the Conservatives worked very effectively together to drive the Liberal House Leader just around the bend. And what really made it uh, an issue of principle for the NDP and the Conservatives was the Liberals put forward changing changes to what are called our standing orders. Now the standing orders are a dry book of rules that include things that are often ignored, like you're not allowed to interrupt anyone when they're speaking. Uh, I like that one myself, that's standing order 16, or speak disrespectfully of another MP, that's standing order 18. I know them by heart because I rise on points of order frequently to point out the fact that it's against our rules. But other rules, such as what days we sit, what hours we sit, in what orders are bills considered, that sort of thing. The history of protocol in Parliament is that those standing orders are never changed unless all parties agree. So the idea is a, a party with a majority of the votes can't change the way we meet, change our schedule, change what days, and so on. And what Bardish Chager, the Liberal House Leader, by the way, she's the first woman ever to be a government house leader, that was a big deal. Uh, but anyway, and right away, as soon as she was made Liberal House Leader, the Conservatives appointed Candace Bergen. Candace Bergen is the first opposition, official opposition house leader. Anyway, women are showing up all over the place and still not all getting all that better. But anyway, uh, Bardish put forward changes to standing orders, which then went to the Procedure and Parliamentary Procedure Affairs Committee. And then it became apparent that Liberals thought they could push through their changes by majority vote instead of by getting everything. I won't, I won't have time to tell you how bad this all got, just to say as a point of principle, I completely supported the NDP and the Conservatives in saying, this is bad, filibustering the Procedural Affairs Committee makes sense. So nothing was going on in the Procedural Affairs Committee for months. It went on from as I said, early March, and then over the Easter break, Bardish Chager reconsidered, came back after Easter, and dropped all the most controversial parts of what she was proposing in the standing orders. But the opposition parties didn't declare victory and stopped the filibuster. The filibusters continued, and they also spread upstairs in the House of Commons itself, so that very little was getting done. That's why there were a slew of bills suddenly introduced in June, after the government house leader put forward a change in procedure to stop the, what for lack of procedural parliamentary terms, I'll just describe as shenanigans. Uh, using parliamentary procedure to stop what was going on in the House, throw the government off course, they put a bill forward for debate in the morning. Within an hour it was clear that no work was going to get done that day because one silly motion after another silly motion led to forced votes until all the time was up and nothing was getting done. So at the end of May, Orange Chamber brought forward what was inevitable was a requirement that we sit through the month of June till midnight every night and, and a temporary suspension of the ability of MPs to put forward shenanigan motions. So once June hit, things really came out as like you were getting the end of a fire post when the bills were right. We had had Bill C-45 tabled earlier in the spring, but it had never made it to second reading or to start a committee. That is the cannabis legislation, legalizing cannabis. This week, the Health Committee came in early to start hearing witnesses on that. We also had legislation tabled in June to amend the Oceans Act. That's one I generally support but want to amend. We had legislation put forward that I really like to amend the Elections Act. Uh, this bill will largely repair what the previous conservative government did 
in what I think was called pretty universally the Unfair Elections Act, the one that made it, uh, it that restricted the ability of the chief electoral officer to advise Canadians about electoral fraud, uh, to restrict the ability of people to vote. Uh, this has now been changed. Well, it isn't changed yet. It's proposed to be changed in Bill C-33. One thing I really like about Bill C-33, if there's any, I see a few young people in the room. Uh, once this bill is law, there's no reason to think it won't become law since the Liberal government put it forward and they have the most votes. I support this. The idea is that uh, the Chief Electoral Officer in Elections Canada will be instructed to go into the schools and register 16 year people between 16 and 18 will be encouraged to register to vote before they turn 18 so that when they turn 18, it's very easy to go and vote the first time because you're already a registered voter. So it's a smart move that I quite like. Um, there are another really significant piece of legislation that was tabled right at the end of June is the Liberals' response after a long consultation period to what the Conservatives had done in Bill C-51, the uh, anti-terrorism legislation so-called of the previous government. The new bill is labeled Bill C-59. It gets a lot of things right about changing our securities legislation and security changing. It's a real overhaul. It would create a national security <laughs> agency that would have oversight over <laughs> all the different, well, they're basically spy agencies. We have a lot. We don't think about it. We have CSIS, the RCMP, Canadian Border Services Agency, and CSEC, which is the organization which gobbles up downloads of millions of pieces of information off the internet and searches it for metadata. And we we'll talk about that later, but there's you know, finally an agency that's watching over all of them and make sure they're talking to each other, which is rather important. That bill has some weak spots, some good spots. I expect to be very active on that when the House resumes. Meanwhile, we also have, which I wrote to you about in the household that I sent to everybody in um, late August, a, a discussion paper on environmental assessment Fisheries Act, Navajo Waters Protection Act, and fixing the National Energy Board. That was a real disappointment because they had the Liberals had convened four separate discussion and consultation processes on those. The most expensive and impressive ones were two expert panels that toured Canada. So the expert panel on the NEB and the expert panel on environmental assessment had made recommendations that, for the most part, I thought were fantastic. But through this very strange attitude. Sorry, I played it again. That door is breathing. There it goes. Thank you. Okay. So anyway, uh, that discussion paper, they've extended the deadline for comment till tomorrow. But the original deadline was August 28th. Uh, very distressing for me because I really believe that the Liberals would fix environmental assessment would fix the Navajo Waters Protection Act, would fix our Fisheries Act, and would put the National Energy Board back with the mandate it has had for decades and no longer be doing environmental reviews. Unfortunately, the discussion paper suggests that the only thing that's going to be even partially really fixed is the Fisheries Act. So I'm happy to answer questions about that, but I'm keenly aware that I gave myself 15 minutes. I'll turn it over to Adam. Uh, if you want to know more again, Discussion, the other things that happened this summer of note were the cabinet shuffle, the creation of two departments of Indigenous and Northern Affairs in Canada, one for services to First Nation and one to deal with treaty rights. Recent cabinet shuffles affect other portfolios as well. And of course, we have the ongoing NAFTA negotiations and the proposed tax changes that Bill Morneau put forward, which I think are spectacularly unpopular, and I don't like them either, just so you know. I now pass it over to our MLA, Adam Nelson. Thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, thank you all for like uh, coming out this evening and taking some time out of your out of your evening to uh, come and engage in both federal and provincial politics. It's an, it's an honor to be uh, your representative uh, in Victoria. Um, I, am, I am deeply honored to, to, uh, to have this role. 
and I just want to report that I really, really love this job. <laughs> um, it is, it is a, a, a very, very fulfilling job, and um, it's, it's, been, it's been a very interesting summer, as you probably may, may know, um, if you've seen a paper and on any day in this summer. Uh, it's been a very, very interesting job, but I have really, really fully engaged the constituency work this summer. We've had well over 100 meetings, I think about 120 or 130 meetings throughout the summer, uh, meeting with various community groups and individuals. Uh, we've got a, a number of files that have been opened and, and we're, we're working to, to try to solve some of those challenges as well. Trying to um, find solutions in, in, uh, in the broader community as well. Uh, I spent uh, quite a bit of time early on through May, uh, through May and June um, in the legislature at a time when in which uh, MLAs wouldn't necessarily be spending a lot of time in the legislature uh, because, as as you probably know, the the margins in that place were very very tight. Uh, there's been a little bit of breathing room open up over the past uh, few weeks, but um, but still we've got uh, a, a minority government with only a with only a few seats difference, and um, really embarking on a on a new journey for BC politics, one that hasn't uh, one that a minority government we haven't had since the 1950s, and so it truly is an honor to be able to be uh, a member in that legislature and, and embarking on a journey which. During the campaign, I talked a lot about changing the dialogue, changing the tone, changing uh, uh, British Columbia politics for the better. And um, I can tell you, I can, I can report back to you that, in fact, political parties can get along if they choose to. And um, so, so far, so good. I think, uh, in terms of finding a way to bring two political parties, and you all know the election, you know the conversation, the dialogue that was going on, I don't need to, to go through that, I, but I can tell you that we have learned, and I think we all know this inherently, but we have learned that good relationships are founded on good quality communication. And what uh, we, the, the caucus that I'm a part of, and the government have committed to is good communication. And we've signed an agreement called a Confidence and Supply Agreement. It's not, it's foreign to us here in British Columbia, but it is not foreign to other governments that are very functional around the world, primarily in New Zealand, and as well in the past uh, in Ontario. Governments that have been very successful in finding ways to work together. Supply and confidence agreements are not foreign to them. And we're hoping that, in fact, we make confidence and supply agreements in British Columbia the norm and not and, and not the exception. Because a confidence and supply agreement is an agreement that essentially outlines um, how two political parties that ran on different platforms with different ideas and different solutions can bring those solutions together in a place and have a mature conversation about how to reconcile the differences. I think we should be celebrating that and, and we have been celebrating it every day that it's been successful. And we do take the take that um, take that agreement, and we and we and we celebrate it on a daily basis. It's not it's not one that we take for granted in any way. It's one that we work hard every day. Just like I work hard every day to maintain and improve the relationship that I have with my partner and with my kids. I'm applying those, and we are applying those exact same principles to government. And. Uh, and it's fascinating and it's amazing and it's actually very thrilling to be a part of it. I'm very proud to be in this position. Um, so throughout the throughout the first few months, uh, I've heard a lot from people that we didn't vote for this. This was not what we voted for. And um, I I agree with that. We voted for 87 individuals. And, and those 87 individuals make a government. And in the past, when we have majority governments only, um, when one party can can control the entire debate, the entire tone of, a, of an entire four-year term, 
um, that's what we get. And so what's, uh, what's really interesting is that government is supposed to work the way it's working right now. And it's unfortunate that for the past 60 years we've seen other types of governments and governments operating and behaving actually inappropriately for the most part. In our negotiations with both parties, we entered into those negotiations in good faith. And um, I have to say that it was, a, it, was a, it was a fascinating time for a couple, a few weeks. And what the commitment that I and my, my colleagues made to each other was that we were going to work towards creating a stable government that lasted four years. And a lot of the a lot of the narrative, a lot of the reporting has been this government's only going to last six months, this government's only going to last nine months, this government would be lucky to last 18 or 24 months. And frankly, we entered into it with the perspective that in fact anything less than four years is not doing our job. That we have a responsibility to the people of British Columbia that vote for us every four years to make the absolute most out of the mandate that we've been given, and that there's an expectation, there's an expectation from us, and that we have that expectation of our colleagues, that we will do what we can, we're all mature adults, to find a way to make it work for the mandate that the people gave us. It's not up to us to determine that we deserve a majority. It's not up to us to, to determine that the voters in British Columbia were incorrect in delivering the legislature that you delivered and we delivered. And so our goal was to create an agreement that would then stabilize British Columbia that could have a government. And what we what we noted and what we saw from it was that there was one party that was very much willing to enter into a negotiation that was based on creating that solid government. And there was one that was not so much willing to. That at the beginning, it was very difficult to demonstrate that or to uh, tell people that. Uh, but what we saw when we went back in in June was just exactly that, a complete um, saying one thing and, and then behaving in a completely different way, saying that we would not go, that the former Premier would not go to the Lieutenant Governor and seek uh, a new election and then going to the Lieutenant Governor and doing nothing other than just seeking a new election. And it was, that, it was that kind of negotiation which put us in a situation where we signed the confidence and supply agreement with the current government. And in that agreement were a lot of pieces that we talked about and important pieces that will be coming up in the next few weeks. Uh, getting big money out of government, electoral finance reform, um, letting British Columbians vote on uh, electoral reform, uh, proportional representation, uh, uh, participating for the first time in truly participating in the Kinder Morgan debate and using all the tools that we can to put a stop to that and threatening the Salish Sea, which is just off, which is just off uh, our shore here. A fair wage commission to determine what the correct wage should be for all parts of British Columbia, uh, not just creating one wage that should work for everybody, but having an arm's length government commission that says that, under, that, that we need to not politicize the, the uh, minimum wage, but we need to find a mechanism and create a mechanism that sets the correct minimum wage. And of course, education, health, transportation, and childcare were all parts that featured prominently in the confidence and supply agreement. Part of the conversation, and I don't know where I'm at, so somebody, when I get close to 15 minutes, I'm not, not, I'm not so diligent it's at okay. changing. You've got to keep time in. Okay, great. I'll ask you. <laughs> um, if you've seen the conversation, particularly around child care, it's been an interesting narrative that's can come out uh, in, the, in the papers and in the media over the last couple of days on this. The media has asked, the, the government, why didn't $10 a day daycare feature prominently in your budget? Why didn't a $400 renter's rebate, uh, as was promised in the election, feature prominently in your budget? Well, precisely because um, we are communicating with one another. And in the confidence and supply agreement, 
if you if you go and look at the confidence and supply agreement, you don't see ten dollar a day daycare. What you see is a commitment to creating an affordable child care program so that parents with young children like me can have options so that they can go to work and then so that their kids are looked after. So when we were negotiating, we were having a conversation. We didn't arrive at our platform position on child care or the government's uh, position on, on child care. What we arrived at was something in the middle, which is a negotiated position which says we've got a lot more work to do. So the reason why you don't see $10 a day daycare, even though the government is what the government is, is because they've agreed we're going to communicate with one another. We're going to negotiate with one another. And, and, and we weren't able to come to a, to a decision point at this, right at this time, so we're going to continue the conversation. On the other hand, they also knew that we didn't support just, a, just giving a blanket $400 renter's rebate out. And that there was going to be some pushback. And Andrew Weaver was very clear that he was going to push back strong on that. He did not believe in it. And so rather than put it forward, the government wanted to have a conversation so that we could then stand next to each other on it. And our goal is that if we're communicating with one another, if we're giving each other notice, if we are living true to the five most important words in that confidence and supply agreement, good faith, so forward, oh, and, good faith, and no surprises. And I think that that's what our relationships are about. That's what the relationships are about in this room right now, coming into a room with a group of people that we enter into here with good faith, and that there's a commitment from each other that we're not going that someone's not going to surprise us with whatever <laughs> that your imagination can want or not. But the point is, is that we enter into these agreements with one another all the time, and it's it's not foreign to us. And that's fundamentally when when the media says to me, Adam, are you going to pull the house down because the government said this or because the government said that or the government didn't do this or didn't do that? I said no, because we're communicating about it. I was aware that they were going to do that, or I was aware that they weren't going to do that. And we talked it out. We had a conversation. And the media has, has been very sensational in this, and of course they're, they're not used to this situation, and they're looking for the story. And when I was in media school, if it bleeds, it leads. That's what we were taught. If it bleeds, it leads. That's what you see on the front headlines. So today or yesterday, you woke up and you said, and you saw on the front page of the paper, Andrew Weaver says, NDP uh, election platform is irrelevant. He said that. But that's not the context that he said it in. What he said it in was, the child care component of the NDP platform is not relevant to the discussion because codified in our confidence and supply agreement is a different statement. And that's the conversation that we're going to be having. That's the starting point of the conversation that we are going to have around childcare. And if you don't see an item in the confidence and supply agreement, then the government's platform plan is not irrelevant. It's very relevant. And it's the conversation starting point at which we, my colleagues, and the, our colleagues in the official opposition, will then be playing our role as Her Majesty's official opposition and the party with three MLAs. I hope that I've been able to explain to you the relationships and as they're evolving in the legislature tonight, there are or in the legislature over the past uh, number of weeks, there are a ton of issues and I recognize them. They go right from housing all the way through to health care and education and transportation and local governance and the list goes on and on and on. The budget, which we're debating right now, and my, my speech for the budget debate will be on Monday. It's going to be just ripping. <laughs> I, I imagine everybody will be tuned in to Hansard's and show me that. Um, my time's up? I'll finish this. I just want to say, over the next few months, what you'll hear from me and from my colleagues is we will be addressing three main issues over and over and over again. We'll be addressing, and it's a, it's, a, it's a package of three main issues that talk about our communities and what kind of communities that we want. And 
we talking about housing? We'll be talking about climate change, and we'll be talking about the emerging economy <coughs> and how we are going to uh, how we are going to embrace the changes in labor, in work, in the types of work, how we are going to embrace the changing climate, sea level rise, which is going to impact us here and all throughout southern, uh, well, all throughout British Columbia, but on the rivers and the banks of the Salish Sea, it's going to impact us, and how we are going to house ourselves and house our pe and house people, how we are going to turn housing units into homes again, so that people are well housed, but not only that, they feel comfortable in their home, comfortable that their home is not going to be swept out from underneath them so that then they can be productive in, in our economy. So thank you for giving me a few minutes over time, Elizabeth, and we're happy to answer your questions, what, as she said, whatever they are, and um, thank you for indulging me. So thank you. Metis 
Parents. Just to be checked. Can people hear? No. no. Louder. Maybe closer to the mic. I'm sorry, Neil. In addition, she has subsequently been registered in the province of British Columbia and issued a birth certificate naming the adoptive parents as her legal parents. There is enough evidence available to show that policies were not followed by the MCFD, who continue to stand in the way of this protected Indigenous right. The United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People has been accepted by the Federal Government of Canada without exception and adopted by the NDP Government of British Columbia last week. Article 7 of that document clearly states, quote, Indigenous people have the collective right to live in freedom, peace, and security as distinctive people, as distinct people, and shall not be subjected to any act of genocide or any other act of violence, including forcibly removing children of the group to another group, unquote. My first question to Adam Olson. As opposition to the NDP and as an elected representative in our writing, are you prepared to encourage your leader, Andrew Weaver, to use his influence with the new Premier, John Horgan, to require the MCFD to follow through on their adoption of the United Nations Declaration as stated? My second question is to Elizabeth May. Custom adoption is a tradition that has gone on in the Métis culture since before recorded time. It is a right protected under Section 35 of the Constitution of Canada, and for that reason, and that of the UN Declaration, is a concern of the federal government. What are you prepared to do at the federal level to step in and make sure the needs of this innocent child are met? and that she is returned to her matey adoptive family without delay, as has been ordered by a court of competent jurisdiction in the Northwest Territory Supreme Court. This case was a no-brainer. This case was an easy fix. There was no reason for MCFD to spend tens of millions from the public purse, or for the adoptive parents to sell their house in order to pay three quarters of a million in legal fees. This child was thriving in a loving forever home and MCFD ripped her out of it for no reason other than the fact that they could. Every resident of BC should be furious about the fact that we have had a ministry that has been working against the common good of the people and we are now trusting you to fix it. And so I ask you both, please, to pull every string, to bend every ear, to ensure this little girl is brought home to her mother and father, where she belongs. Uh, Neil, I thank you for uh, raising this this evening. And I want, I, I want you to know that not only has my office been working on this, but my colleague Sonia Firstenau's office has been working on it, and our colleague, um, uh, Nick Simons, uh, the member uh, for Powell River Sunshine Coast's office, has been working on this, in addition to the new minister and as well the Attorney General. Uh, we found, as, as I, I found out about this when I got elected, as did the government, just got into this file, the new government just got into this file when they were sworn in a few weeks back. And I can tell you that uh, I've met with MCFD at the First Nations gathering, the First Nations leadership gathering just last week. We had a conversation about this. I, I hope that you appreciate that there's some confidentiality issues here uh, for the child and for the family that, that I can bring up in here, but I can I want you to be assured that, that there are multiple MLA's offices working on this particular file. With respect to um, with respect to me getting Andrew Weaver to use his influence with John Horgan, I can tell you that that's not how it necessarily works because I don't need John, I don't need Andrew Weaver to talk to John Horgan about this. Uh, Scott Fraser, who's the minister of, uh, talk about Andrew. Scott Fraser, Minister Fraser, and I have got a very, very strong working relationship. 
He spoke yesterday on the 10th anniversary of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People. I was given unanimous consent, uh, an honor that was bestowed upon me by all 86 of my colleagues to be able to stand up and speak to it. It's a commitment of ours in uh, the, the Confidence and Supply Agreement. We are working towards adopting uh, the United the UNDRE. Um, and so I can I can answer this question on, at, bo at both of those levels, and I'll turn it over to Elizabeth. Thank you. I say, it, as I recall, we were working on this quite a lot, trying to do what we could, although there wasn't a federal aspect to it that I saw. Although you've sketched out a federal aspect I could work on. But Mary Ellen Turpel also called on the uh, Attorney General to intervene and not allow this child to be removed and put with an adoptive family in Ontario. Uh, and the child was removed. It's been, it's been almost a year now. And, uh, I certainly will try to do what I can federally, but I, I, have, I think it's a more direct route to get the new Attorney General to do something to reverse what was, a, 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 I think, a heartbreaking miscarriage of justice. So I'll see what I can do federally, Neil. I appreciate you raising it. Thank you very much. Will you both accept a, a copy of my notes? Oh, sure. And, and, and while Neil gives us the notes next up to the microphone, and you may need to, to, to lower it. Good evening. My name is Diana Byford. And first of all, I would like to say thank you, a big thank you to Elizabeth May for the weeks and months of effort she put in to electoral reform last year. She gave us a very <laughs> As you know, Elizabeth, I'm a big advocate for reform. And to my dying breath, I will talk about it until it's happened. Um, Adam, I realize that you're involved with a, a new situation and that it's been a really, really busy time for you. And so the meeting that you and I talked about at the Aircraft Museum Open House Day has not yet taken place. But I have a lot of information for you. Um, a meeting was scheduled but had to be canceled because you had other commitments. And um, I'm really looking forward to meeting with you and giving you all this information. A lot of it, I really think you need to go through. Most people talk about proportional representation and they don't understand it. I did before I was on the Citizens' Assembly. Now I do understand it and I understand it fully and I'm prepared to answer any questions about it that you might have, any concerns I can probably find you an answer to those concerns. I've kept everything from my years on the assembly and I can find it in a moment, so don't hesitate to ask. I would just like to say that I know you're really busy, but I'm hoping that we can have a conversation soon because the idea of a referendum actually scares me. Not that it might fail, but that people are being asked a question that they can't answer properly because they do not understand. So there's a lot to be talked about. Um, I'm not going to take up any more time because I think there's a lot of people here that have questions, but if there's anything you'd like to comment to me. Well, if I can come, first of all, Dan, Diana, just so everyone here knows, Dan served as she said on the BC Citizens Assembly. And then as a volunteer, there were many people in Citizens Assembly who had other jobs. Dan told me many times that she, uh, realized people needed to know more before the first referendum, the one that we got 57% support for moving to single transferable vote in BC. Diana gave her all time traveling BC to explain to anyone who would listen. I don't know how many speeches you gave or how far you traveled and sacrificed. Over 150. Over 150 meetings that she did as a volunteer to explain single transferable vote. I will say one of the more striking bits of evidence in our elected reform committee work, and we did, I'm very proud of the work we did. We produced a terrific report, even though it was immediately trashed. But the, one of the things we were told by a post, polling firm was that they had given Canadians a multiple choice question. So they didn't have to know off the top of their head how to name a voting system. They listed uh, uh, first past the post, ranked ballot, single transfer, proportional representation, prefer. They listed things and they asked Canadians to name the system we currently use. That's all. 
and fewer than 40 percent could accurately name the system we currently use. So no wonder people be confused if being asked, would you like to get rid of the system we currently use? Uh, there's not going to be a lot of basis for making that decision without a substantial and substantive public education effort. Now, you may want to have Al speak to what kind of referendum we're going to have in BC. And show of hands if people like to hear that part before we move to the next question. There's a few, yeah, there's quite a lot. Adam, why don't you just speak to what the confidence and supply agreement says on the subject of changing our voting system, if you don't mind. Thank you, Diane. Thank you for your work um, on, on advocating for this. It is, uh, it, we uh, had a lot of agreement that the, about the outcome, not a lot of agreement about the process. In the election, uh, I was very clear in that I thought that we should have, uh, we should we should make the change and then and then talk about which system to change to. Uh, the, the government had a different approach, and so uh, in this one we we have made a decision that we're going to go to a referendum. It's not my favorite situation, uh, but that said, this is where we're at. My colleagues, not your first time, I was leading the charge on this portion of of it, and I'll make sure to reconnect you, uh, Diana, with Sonia. I'm leading the finance, the getting the big money out of the politics part of the, the two pieces of, uh, well, there's actually also a lobbying reform piece that I'm working on. So there's three pieces to the comprehensive electoral reform package that, uh, that we would like to see and that's agreed upon in the confidence and supply agreement. So basically, we're having a 50 plus one vote uh, referendum. So 50 plus one, and it will change just to majority. And as well, it's going to happen in the next, in the fall of next year. So we have very little time. And then as well, the other piece to it is that both uh, the government and me and my colleagues have agreed that we would be advocating uh, affirmatively for, like, to vote in favor of, asking people to vote in favor of where in the past government took no position. So um, we will be working towards uh, changing the electoral system through a referendum next fall. Thanks. Uh, Elizabeth, Connie Fogo. I'm um, a refugee from Vancouver, escaping the lower mainland. I have bought property up in Dean Park. Can you use the mic, please? Yes, I am uh, property up in Dean Park. And um, before I ask the question that specifically I came to ask you, I want to recognize you and compliment you for your particularly exemplary work doing the job that you have to do the way I think it should be done. And I'm very, very impressed with the quality of the material you give out. I've only been here, I've had this place since last summer. And uh, your material that you send out is excellent. I have a thousand years of hearing from MPs and MLAs in my lifetime. It's all been crap. You're a thousand? <laughs> I receive information that I value, that means something, you tell me something, I appreciate it. And I just want to acknowledge you for that because it really matters to me. And I have a lot of political experience myself and I know that your work is really so good. So thank you for being here. I'm glad to be in your writing. I'm, I'm partly here because of you, quite frankly. Now, to my question, I chose this area and I live very close to the airport and the planes that flew over here tonight, I don't hear at my house. I do hear since July planes now flying about every 10-15 minutes going round and round and round and really disturbing my peace. When I chose this place, I cared about the airport and worried is it going to bother me because I'm seeking peace and tranquility. I'm seeking environmental safety. Frankly, the information you sent out on the, uh, an earthquake and the possibilities of what could happen here, it was absolutely so useful and wonderful. Thank you for that. But anyway, the point about the airplanes, I want to know what you know about what these airplanes are that are bothering my peace now. There was a little blurb in a local paper where the local mayor, I think from Sydney, made a statement that these Planes are U.S. military planes, and we're going to be living with them now for a period of time. I don't want that. 
I don't want them here. I said, I don't want any planes bothering me the way these are. So I did phone your office. Somebody was supposed to get back to me, and they didn't. Um, so my question to you is, I think that would be a federal matter. Who are these people? What are they doing? And how long are they going to be bothering you? Well, first of all, hi. Welcome to Sanch Gulf Islands. I'm thrilled to be here. I would say that when I, when I, the reason I, forgive me for indulging and just saying why you get the kind of newsletters you get from me. Coming from a, a non-government charity background, when I got elected an MP and realized I am empowered as an MP and expected to get something printed for free that can run to four big pages and it gets mailed out for free to every one of my constituents, I didn't want to fill it with garbage. I didn't think my constituents wanted loads. I've gotten those MP newsletters for years too. Pictures of an MP kissing babies, pictures yeah. of an MP cutting ribbons, you know. So I thought, what a privilege. I, so I do write those myself, just so you know. Uh, I try to pick a theme. In my head, I imagine that some of you actually might save them to look up later for what you're going to say about LNG or seniors issues. Now let me move to planes. Uh, there are many different kinds of planes that could be bothering you, so we need to know more specifically. I apologize that no one got back to you. We need to follow up and figure out how that could have happened. These are, these are new. They're specific, I can tell you they're, they're um, Are they big? Are, well, they're, are you just I've seen a couple of black helicopters as well, but mostly the ones that go around and around, they're a turboprop, okay. and they have... They maybe a skydiving place? No, no, they've got, they've got a, many, most of them have one third kind of a bullet kind of thing on the bottom, underneath one of the wings. Today I saw one that has had one of those big long ones underneath, but also a smaller one on the outside. They're not... You know, they're not the planes that are giving us chemicals in the sky. They're too low. No. They're local. So, but my worry was when I read what the Sydney mayor said that these are military U.S. planes coming from the, uh, these islands over here. What's going on? Okay. So find out what you can. Well, no, I, I just say in general, yes, uh, aviation is federal. Quite a lot of aircraft activity isn't federal because it ends up being uh, air, aerodromes are, well, they are federal, but they're hardly regulated at all. So small private planes, the skydiving thing that's going on, I have a lot of complaints about that. I don't know about this. John, John, have you heard anything about new military planes? He's shaking his head. I'm going to look into it. How many of you have noticed new military planes operating? They're, they're not marked. Okay. They're gray, but they don't. When I put my binoculars up, I can't see any markings on them. I'm just going by what this city mayor said. Well, look. And the fact that there be 10, 15 minutes all well, day. Sure have, I have a number of staff from my constituents here tonight. I'll make sure that Sky or Linda or Jonathan gets your email you phone so we can look into this and get back to you and anybody else who's concerned about this. This is brand new to me. I've had a lot of different, since I've been an MP, I've learned a lot about NAVCAM and flight paths and routes. And I know about, we've got, you know, we're getting new, new helicopters at the squadron, but this doesn't sound like any of that. And what are they doing? Why are they here? Thank right. you. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Good evening, and thank you for coming here and talking to us and listening to us. I too am a refugee from Vancouver, and I thought it was very telling that the lady before me used refugee, because I almost literally feel like a refugee. So I am here to address both of you tonight about some very serious issues in Vancouver that are actually starting to overflow here. People who live here have no idea what's going on there, I'm guessing, unless they've moved there in the last few years. I live in North Saanich, and I honestly feel like I'm in a different country. I'm, I'm like Vancouver was in the 50s. My, my concern is the problems caused by this huge influx of extremely wealthy people from overseas, um, buying up our housing market, often not living in that they buy. There's thousands and thousands, I don't know, the city did a survey of how many empty housing units there were in Vancouver, and people who live here there will tell you they think it was underestimated. Um, they often buy houses, park their money here, and in many cases, they park the wives and one child here, and I was in the neighborhood where this was happening on a huge scale, and then the husband goes back to the country of origin, makes money there, comes back, and, and brings money to the, to the family in Vancouver. To make it worse, the family in Vancouver is often not paying any income tax. 
There's been many, many articles in the media in Vancouver about this, and there's even been cases. I have, I've seen them mostly people's comments in, um, from articles in the Sun and Province of people who are living in houses worth more than a million dollars, and that was about three years ago. So now we're looking at houses worth around two million who are who are accepting welfare, who are accepting free uh, low-cost bus passes because they're not paying any income tax. We need to close that loophole. Um, also, a lot of those people are not contributing. I thought the idea of refuge of immigrants was people who come here, contribute to Canada, work in Canada, pay their taxes, and pay for the next generation coming up for their pensions. Well, a lot of these people are not doing that. So that's a problem. The other problem, and this goes more to the, to, uh, the provincial, is they're forcing the housing market through the roof. I, I just saw in the media about two days ago that five people per day are being made homeless in Vancouver. Uh, I have friends who live in a house, live, sold their house in a neighborhood similar to Oak Bay in the spring. Uh, an old house with a, a, you know, built in, I don't know, 1930s, a six foot high basement. They sold their house for $3.4 million. That is causing a problem here because people like that, and I'm one of them, I didn't get that much for my house because I sold it last year, we come here and we can outbid the locals. And that's causing a problem in the housing market. Here, there, the city uh, introduced a tax to tax people, and now I'm hearing from neighbors that there's companies going around and fixing these houses up that are empty to make it look like somebody lives in them so they're not paying the tax. Certainly, this is a really, really serious problem, and it takes all levels of government to fix it, and I'm not seeing anything happen other than the city put the tax on, and people are finding their ways around it. Did, uh, first of all, welcome to the community, but I didn't get your name. Oh, sorry, Linda McCall. Linda, thank you. Listen, first of all, let me cover the federal piece, because I think a lot of us are aware of this. And I have friends in Vancouver who say the city is going to be killed by this. They just feel that this is an existential crisis for the city of Vancouver. It is. That it's going to be impossible for people to enjoy living in Vancouver. So a lot of levels of government are aware of it. The program you speak of to encourage millionaire investor immigration, and you're absolutely right, Ms. Cardi, that program has been stopped. But not Quebec. We're not, not Quebec, but in, in the federal program has been stopped. Uh, and it was not just anecdotal evidence, but an actual study that proved that real refugees who come here with just the clothes on their back, within a few years, are paying taxes where the millionaire investor class immigrant that got the fast track are years later not paying any income tax because they don't really live here, they're not yes, paying jobs. They don't. So that is, it remains a very serious issue. I know it's a high priority for the federal government. It's identified the need for a national housing strategy, I know it, I saw a lot of language in the confidence and supply agreement between the BC Greens and BC New Democrats, so I expect action on housing, but I don't know the specifics of what the provincial government is thinking of, and I don't know if Adam is ready to speak at this yet or if we need more time. Can I add a couple of things? My understanding is they're still, they're still coming through Quebec. The federal government, which I read in the media about three years ago, is actually paying Quebec for these people, and there was a study done, and about 95% of them are moving to BC. So one thing you could do is cut off the payments. I don't know if you can look into cutting off those payments to Quebec to the people that are actually here and Quebec is getting this money for who knows what. The other issue that's happened in Vancouver, that, well in a suburb that is very worrying to me is there's a, an example of a condo board carrying on their legal condo business in Mandarin so the people who spoke a language of Canada can't participate in the meetings. Now to me, if you're doing any legal business in Canada, it needs to be in English or French. End of story. That's a huge problem. And also, there's these people, some, my neighbor lived here for 10 years and does not speak a word of English. Linda, sorry, I'm going to pass to Adam. I'm going to address some of this because I think actually the problem is much bigger than any one country or any one uh, ethnic group of people. Um, Frankly, this is a this is a philosophical issue that British Columbia has has been evolving towards over over decades. But frankly, it's been exacerbated in the, in the past handful of years. There has been a, and, and I, we face it in the election. We face it in the last election. There were economic promises that were made. 
that we were going to have a, an economy that was going to be founded on uh, a resource that didn't ever happen. And then what ended up happening was this, act, this uh, investment, the housing investment, housing commodification of housing solely for the commodity of the house, parking money in a house, started to make provincial government an awful lot of money and it propped up an economy and made it appear that a lot more was going on. Absolutely. So when we were raising issues about how to deal with this, the provincial government at the time allowed it to continue. And what it's done is it's, is it's and, and I understand that there's a lot of people in the room right now whose house, meet, the, the value in their house means an awful lot to you. It means your retirement, it means your security, it means everything. So I, I want to be clear that I recognize that and I want to acknowledge it right now. But at, the, at a much higher level, the, the commodification of our homes, and I mentioned it in my opening, we need to actually have a much broader discussion, and, and I understand that this is not what you're talking, you want me to provide you a, a, an answer right now, but I think that actually, or, or, or policy solutions right now, how to just turn this on a dime, and I actually don't think that we can. I think that we can put a housing strategy forward, and I think that in the budget we saw modular homes for homeless people, we saw some affordable units, but until we actually change our thinking about housing units, which is the way government looks at it, and homes, and the and the and and housing as a as a and the, the property transfer tax as the most important line of revenue source, because it props up the, the rhetoric around uh, economy, which which we want everybody to think our economy is the highest performing economy. It's pro primarily because of this activity, I agree. which doesn't, which actually hollows out communities. Yes. It hollows out our security and our safety, which I was talking about. There is in British Columbia, if we want to use economic terms, an endless supply of demand. Exactly. Okay. And so we it doesn't matter. Really right? it the, the answer was. You know, leading into the election and in the years past, it's the municipality's fault. They're not building enough. Uh, they're not building enough uh, units. They're not building enough stock inventory. Mm -hmm. But when you've got an endless supply of demand, it doesn't matter how much inventory you build. You could build forever. You could build on all the farmland. You could build to the skies, and you would still have people wanting to move here or wanting, at the very least, to invest Perfect. in this place. Like Park their money in this place. Yes. So the answer is not just build our way out of the problem. No, That's what we tried to do. The answer is to diversify the provincial economy away from property transfer tax so that we're not entirely built on it. That's the piece that I was talking about earlier, the emerging economy, talking about tech, talking about how we can bring the resource economy which built this province, this province was built on into the 21st century. Um, and we've got some ideas on that. And we also have to we also have to tackle head on, and this is not going to necessarily be that popular of a thing to say, but it needs to be said that there was a message that was put out that everybody deserves a, to own a home. I think everybody deserves a home that they can afford to live in and that provides them security. The notion of home ownership being the ultimate end goal for everybody in our society, I think, is one that we need have a conversation about. We have to recognize that there is a housing continuum and people fit within it. I only recently became a homeowner. I'm 41 years old and I got to this point only because of the current situation that I live in. And I, so I think, I think that, I think that what I'm demonstrating here is the complexity. I'll, I'll end on, on, Elizabeth grab the mic, so I'm going to end with two things here. One, municipal affairs and housing. Finally, the housing file in our province is with municipal affairs and not with the LNG minister. I'm not sure why it was with the LNG minister, oh but it is finally where it belongs with minister affairs. Wait, I have, and they didn't even have municipal affairs minister. The we had a community minister. They were called communities. And so I've worked, I've started to have conversations with, uh, with Minister Selena Robinson. We will have these conversations about housing. It's going to be both a mixture of putting in place policy, but also starting to have the broader philosophical conversations that I introduced tonight. I'm sorry to have to, to, to say that um, I really, sorry, I'm just, oh, Linda. 
There's four people lined up behind you, and we only have less than 20 minutes left, so forgive me, we're going to move on to the, and I don't know if there's more than the four people, we're going to do our best to answer every question of everyone here, but we can talk to you after the end of the meeting, because there's a lot here, and I'm really glad you chose to move to San Angelo Highlands. Also, saving our farmland. Yes. So, the, the next person in the there's the four people who are now in the for sure will get to all four of these questions. We probably have time for one or two more, if, we give her, if I give shorter answers and uh, does <laughs> <laughs> Just don't ask what comes <laughs> well, My name is Leo Levisser. Uh, I've spoken to both of you, both of you recently. Adam, I've spoken to you a few weeks ago. Elizabeth, yeah, here, yeah, here, 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 Elizabeth has spoken to you at the Sanch Fair. I don't know if you remember me or not. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't realize I was going to come up here and ask this question. Maybe you can answer it without going into great detail. But uh, I had asked you at the fair with regards to the issue I mentioned, which was regards to the uh, nicotine smoking products being sold in drugstores. Do you recall the conversation we had? I, do you have an answer for me, or should we talk about it at a different time? The, 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 and you raised it with me, and I didn't even, I wasn't even aware that British Columbia was the only province that still does. I will have, I haven't had time to research it, because I haven't been back to my office in Ottawa yet, but I have it on my list for Monday when I get back to Ottawa, so I can, it's, I want to make sure, I think I put your email address down somewhere when I'm talking to the Spanish there. If not, I should grab it now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, had, I had sent an email to the health minister, and I never responded. Right after that, I've got, never got a response, so I don't know where we're at right now. What was the question? And Leo, you know, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have an answer for you at this stage. We're just getting our wheels going. But I've got, uh, I've, we had the meeting, and so we'll, right. I'll be sitting and having a chat with Adrian Dix about that as well. Right. Basically, it was just an issue where uh, BC, hard to believe, but BC is the only province in the entire country where, where drugstores are still allowed to sell cigarettes. They're supposed to be looking after your health. Why are they selling cigarettes? Uh, Nunavut has a smoke rate of 74%. Here we're only 15%. We can do better than that still. But the problem is the hypocrisy is DC drugstores are getting their selling cigarettes out the front door, but in the back of the pharmacy is they're enrolling you in the smoking cessation program. They're getting paid at the front, they're getting paid at the, at the back. That's the hypocrisy. And it shouldn't exist here in this province because we, we we can do better than that. Thank you a lot, Leo. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Hello, it's a nice to be excited. See you tell us that I'm here at the end of the day. This hero is at the end of the day. I want to thank you both. For this meeting tonight, it's it's something that's really important, especially on first nations issues. I come here and talk about grave sites. Thirty-five years now, I've been talking about it. My ancestors have been talking about this for what almost hundred years. When and what government is in? talk about and fix the issue of grave sites. I have grave sites in Saikam that's right under West Sandwich Road. Not only West Sandwich Road is the Gulf Islands, a desecration of our people out there. Grave robbers. People out there digging up our ancestors and taking all the things out of the graves. And what are we going to do about it? We need to change. We had an election. We need to change as a whole. Not only certain people. We talk about child care. We need to change in child care. The residential school system is still here. We're still beggars in this country. Under the child care, you have white people telling us what to do, how to live. That's wrong. They don't understand the way we live. I'm proud of being a First Nations. I'm a whole I'm from Saipan. Let's have a change. Train our people. 
We worked on this about 15 years ago, We're trying to get the dollars back, not back, but to the First Nations so we can look after our own people. We are capable of doing that. We're not tokens of this country. We're human beings and understand we live every day with our kids and our grandkids, great grandkids. And people come to the so-called reserve to try to tell us what to do, how to live. I'm not. Uh, we need a change. And I'm glad both of you are here. I've been wanting, wanting to talk to both of you. you know, I hope you bring that up to, to Ottawa, Elizabeth. You know, it's, uh, <coughs> We need to change, I'm telling you. Adam, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of your heritage. I watched you grow up. I watched you grow up, you're doing a good job. So, I hope everyone, I didn't come here to put anybody down. I'm talking about my people. We need a change. We're not immigrants. Who was the first people that came over on the boat? For God's sake, it brought the disease over in the booze. And then they call us booze arms. You better think before you talk. Thank you. Thanks, Vern. Um, I've got uh, just a couple of things that I'd like to say. Um, uh, on the, uh, maybe it was on the throne speech day last week, I talked to a former uh, member from Swamal, Maureen Karajanis, who six, seven, eight years in a row, or sessions in a row, brought in a data uh, of Indigenous Heritage Sites and Sacred Sites and Grave Sites Act to, uh, if you can imagine it, they're, they're just not protected. So uh, a cemetery is protected, but an, an indigenous gravesite is not, because it's not it's not sanctified by a priest or something. Um, so it's not protected. Uh, Maureen did some great work that the former government wasn't willing to bring it forward. When I saw her, I said, "Hey, perhaps now your colleagues might be interested in bringing your bill forward. Uh, I might bring it up as a private member's bill, uh, or I'll just say it in the camera here, maybe the." The government can do it. We were, we walked alongside one another for Grace Island. We saw it. We saw how much it cost the taxpayers of BC to, to, to overlook this. Let's not. I mean, just from a from an economic perspective, it's for a human rights perspective. But from an economic perspective, it's just silly the way the government has taken looking after the uh, looked at the approach that they've taken on this. And for child care, I just want to say I met with uh, MCFD and the. One of the local First Nations here when I was in Vancouver. And the message that I gave was, uh, and, and I gave it over and over and over again because I heard it from First Nations leaders, was that First Nations leadership is not seeing Indigenous people in the bureaucracy. And so there's a fundamental disconnect that when the advice that they are being, the, the words that politicians and is, are saying out to the public, and then what's happening at the bureaucratic level, there's a fundamental disconnect. If indigenous people started to see more of, the, of, of indigenous people in the bureaucracy, they could be more confident that what's being said behind closed door, the advice that's being given, is also what's being said publicly. Elizabeth? I just feel moved to say something very nonpartisan when you talk about the Grace Island fight, because we worked on it. We worked, we worked on it side by side, but we also worked on it side by side with our previous MLA, Gary Holman. And I want to thank Gary, but he's not here tonight, but some to let him know that we use. Um, I, I love working with Gary, too. Um, and it's very nonpartisan to acknowledge that he did a great job on that. In fact, it all started because he raised it in question period, and it was at that point that then it became a, uh, an issue to deal with. So I agree 100%. So next up. No, you've got to get closer. Closer and louder. Closer. You have to be louder. Yeah. Okay. My name is Natalie, and uh, I live in Sydney. And my 
printer and it's very simple and um, very dear to me. I am worried about, to put it mildly, the welfare of the chickens. And this is very, um, I, I, I want from you, um, Elizabeth, I, I, I'm hoping that you can do something on a federal level to rework the criminal code um, regarding um, cruelty to animals so that you totally over, um, overwork it so that um, food animals and livestock and um, dairy and egg producing animals are also protected and uh, that they can have reasonable, healthy, happy living conditions while they're growing on our behalf. I, 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 I don't agree for a moment with being omnivores, but I think that any animal that's used for food has rights. And um, I think also that um, the, you have to put teeth in the criminal code um, so that people who offend against all animals in all circumstances can have to pay a big price, whether it's money or prison time or whatever. It is just a price. And uh, Adam, I'm, from a eventual point of view, I'm hoping that you can do something, maybe liaise with um, the MB MDP in the, is that the legislature? I'm not sure. In the, in the provincial government building to um, I'm losing my words, but what I would like to see happen is provincial statutes prohibiting any unnecessary or malicious cruelty to livestock and other um, food animals, and uh, it should be completely prohibited and um, have maximum penalty. And this comes about because of, um, I, I think people have already forgotten it, um, an incident on, um, I think it was June, the, the, the early, early beginning of June, where um, a, a, a terrible, terrible, egregious was the word used by the F, um, SPCA, a egregious abuse of the food chickens on um, the farm equipment, the actual um, transportation so, farm. So now that you might have just in the interest of time, I want to thank you for raising this. I want to tell you that we were we had a lot of people We had a chance to fix to improve the criminal code. So it, right now under the criminal code, animals are property. It is, it is illegal for cruelty to animals, but, and, and that incident in Coquitlam was illegal, and people involved, you know, the industry responded so, but there was a very good bill brought forward at the beginning of this, the 42nd Parliament, by a liberal backbencher named Nathaniel Erskine Smith, who represents the beaches in Toronto. I thought the bill would pass because it was a liberal private member's bill, and he got a lot of advance media support for his bill. Uh, unfortunately, his bill was defeated because most of the Liberals voted against it, and most of the Conservatives voted against it, uh, because unfortunately, it was misunderstood, I believe, by what was what's called the Rural Caucus of the Liberal Party, who thought it would actually shut down agriculture as opposed to what it would do. Now, I don't answer questions on a partisan basis, just to say that the Green Party has adopted and pursues the standards that are used in the European Union. So we're not dreaming in technicolor here. 
to imagine a government actually creating rules around the battery cage sizes for chickens, around the kinds of living conditions for animals that are later going to be slaughtered. These are rules and regulations of the European Union where they still make money in their agriculture sector, but they do have rules and regulations. Unfortunately, Nathaniel Smith bill was defeated. We have to figure it, to find some MP who has some kind of status for a private member's bill, and I'm working on it. We're trying to find someone else who's, I don't know if you know how private member's bills work. You may remember that I got my Lyme disease bill through in the last session of Parliament. There's a lottery at the beginning of Parliament, and every MP gets a number. If you get a good number, that means if you put forward a private member's bill, it will get up for a vote before the parliament is over, like years later. Now, I got a good number my first term. I got a bad number my second term. None of my private member's bills are going to come up for a vote. The Daniel Smith had a really good number, but his bill was then defeated. So that was a really good chance to limit the importation of shark fins, to act to protect all kinds of animals, whether uh, exhibition entertainment animals or food animals. We have to bring it back. It was an excellent bill, so we're still working on it, is all I can say. But thank you, Natalie, and I don't know if Adam needs to comment because we do have two more speakers, and technically our time is up in three minutes. Do you want to add anything? Exactly. No, I, I will need to figure out where this fits within perhaps Ministry of Agriculture. I've got a very good relationship with uh, Minister Fowler. And uh, I'll figure out where it fits within the BC framework. And as the critic for agriculture, if that's the file that brings in, then I'm there. So thank you. Okay, thank you. So our next questioner, very patiently waiting. <laughs> hi, hi, both of you. And I'd like to thank you for giving a voice to people. I think it's the first time I felt comfortable coming to something like this. And that's so I would like to raise a housing concern that I'll be very quick and I'm happy to talk about it at a later time. <laughs> the issue of renting, rent, renters' rights and protection for renters I've seen in my generation over the few years we've lived here with our daughter that a number of my friends and neighbors have been evicted from their homes with no protection and no housing options essentially. So I just would like to ask what protection, what work are you going to be doing to protect renters' rights in on the Gulf? Can I ask your name? Yes, it's Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. So I think this is definitely provincial jurisdiction, so over you Adam. Yeah, so look, I'll just very quickly say that it's in it's in both of the parties' platforms. Uh, the government has spoken about this quite a bit uh, in recent times, and, and I think I think that it is like I said. This is a whole spectrum, right from um, all the way through. There's there's a number of different tenures, a number of different types of housing, and this is a very very important one. It's very important that renters feel secure in their homes, um, and that the relationship between the renter and the landlord is a fair one, um, and that the that the renter has uh, has rights. Of course, um, but that they but they feel secure, and so as I'm working with the minister on this, guaranteed. I, like I said, I just became a homeowner two years ago. Before that, I was a renter. Mm -hmm. um, I did rent for my mom for quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you for your question, Nicole. Well, appreciate it. I, I think this will probably be your last question, but I think Adam and I can both hang around if anything you want to come up and ask a specific personal question. So your name, please. Hi, my name is Brian, and I live in Brentwood Bay, and I work for the federal government, and uh, my question is about the Phoenix pay system. Yes. Um, <laughs> in my branch that I work in, there's people that are being overpaid and underpaid thousands of dollars, and some people that are not getting paid at all. This issue, as everyone knows, has been going on for a very long time. I was wondering what um, the current government is doing about it and what's your visibility on the matter. Thank you very much, Brad. First of all, the Phoenix pay system is a nightmare and it was a, a predictable nightmare. And it's not that it's been going on for a very long time, it's been going on for as long as the Phoenix pay system has existed, which was a, an, an incredibly bad idea of the previous government. Why the Trudeau Liberals continue to try to fix it 
It may be that they're in it so deep with this particular computer program, however you describe it. We used to have predictable payment of civil servants. It wasn't an issue. They were paid within their department. Harper undertook some very strange economy moves. One was called Shared Services Canada to try to combine administrative functions for various departments. It was a predictable boondoggle, probably cost us more money than ever saved. The Phoenix pay system has replaced the normal <coughs> preparation of pay slips. I know our team in the office works on it all the time. It's, as soon as somebody, for instance, goes on that leave, their pay is all messed up. If they take a short leave and come back, their pay is all messed up. Uh, the, there is a new minister responsible for this, and she's a BC minister, Carla Faltro got the change from where she was in Trudeau's cabinet to being responsible. It's still described as fixing the Phoenix pay system. I don't know that it can be fixed. I think if something is this far broken, it may not be fixable. Now, I'm not an expert in, as anyone who works with me can tell you, I have a hard time figuring out what's wrong with my laptop when it does something fluky. I'm not really good with technology like my, my computer and my Blackberries, but I, I struggle with them. But my instinct is enough is enough. This thing is so badly broken, no matter what it costs, I'd rather scrap it than try to fix it. Now that's just me speaking for myself. So frustrated with what we hear in our office about how many people sometimes waiting six months for a paycheck. Can you imagine? No, it's not it's craziness. So maybe some Outside technical expert can be brought in. Let me ask your opinion, Brian. Do you think they can fix it? I think it's beyond repair. <laughs> so much time in our office is sorting out issues with people's pay. Time is taken away from mm -hmm. our actual jobs. And it's frustrating because we have new employees that are coming and they don't even want to work with us because they don't know when they're going to get paid or if they're going to get paid because they can't even get hold of somebody in the pay center to answer the question. Yeah, no problem. Okay, you're making me feel better about me feeling radical. Jonathan, could you step forward with Shannon for a moment? It's the end of the meeting, but I'm missing this little boy's birthday party tomorrow because I'm going to Salt Spring. So, Jamie, I'd just like to sing Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday, dear Jamie. Happy Birthday.
This is, as Elizabeth said, a 100, even though we, we do represent the same party cousins, federally and provincially, you should know that these are 100% uh, nonpartisan events. We are your representatives. We are working for you. And I think that you might have noted that tonight I've made every effort to not mention any party names, even though in BC it's been very partisan just in terms of the relationship. So we are nonpartisan. We are working together as your representatives. And uh, please sign up for, for my newsletter so that then I can inform you about the next time you have the opportunity to come and ask questions and hear about what's going on in your legislature. So, Hi, Chad, thank you for coming this evening.